Hello everyone, welcome to the daily newspaper analysis brought by Shankar IS Academy. Today, 5th October 2024, displayed here are the articles that we are going to discuss. The first article, have serious doubts about legality and validity of Lieutenant Governor's power, says Supreme Court. This article is taken from the newspaper Indian Express. The next article, 28 Naxalites killed by security forces in Chhattisgarh gunfight. This newspaper article is taken from the newspaper The Hindu. And the next article, how elephants are counted. This article is talking about the sharp decline of elephant population in large part of India, including West Bengal, Kerala, Odisha, Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand. This article is taken from the newspaper The Indian Express. And the next article, Maldivian President to visit India next week. This article is taken from the newspaper The Hindu. This article is talking about the upcoming visit of Maldivian President Mohammed Moisu from October 6 to 10. So let us discuss this. And before moving into the discussion, there is an important announcement from Shanghai IS Academy. Shanghai IS Academy's pre-storming UPSC Prelims Test Series 2025 Batch 2 will be starting on 5th October 2024. So we know that after every year. So join the course and boost your prelims preparation. And link for the registration will be given in the description. And now without much delay, let's get into our newspaper's discussion. Look at this newspaper article. 28 Naxalites killed by security forces in Chhattisgarh gunfight. This newspaper article is talking about an anti-Naxalite operation called Operation Overview in which the security forces killed 28 Naxalites. And the total number of insurgents killed this year touches 185. So let us discuss more about Naxalism. So the origin of Naxalism can be traced back to the Naxalbari district of West Bengal in the year 1967. Naxalism is one of the ideologies that was influenced by the left wing. And to understand about the left wing principles, we have to understand about the history of 19th century. We will discuss that briefly. See, the 19th century, the world, that means the Europe, was going through industrial revolution. And as a part of industrial revolution, two new social classes emerged in the society. First one was bourgeoisie and second one was proletariat. And the bourgeoisie controlled the means of production, including factories, where the proletariat sold his labor to the bourgeoisie for income. But the social setup was supporting bourgeoisie. Therefore, the, the proletariat were exploited, paid minimum wages, and had to work for long hours to get minimum wage. And the working condition was very bad. And Karl Marx stood for the justice of the working class. And through his studies, he wrote two important works. One was Das Capital, and second one was Communist Manifesto. And th his principle called for, his ideology called for a revolution where the working class had to organize under the banner of a communist party and they will overthrow the social, political and economic system established by the capitalist bourgeoisie. And after the revolution, the working class will establish a state socialism or a socialist state where the working class will have the power. For after a period of time, this socialist state will wither away and therefore it will lead to formation of a communist society where the society is regulated by the communities and the means of production will be free from all type of authority. So this is the idea of left wing or the left-wing principle. And this remained theoretical until the World War I. In, in, in spite of the World War I, in the year 1917, through Russian Revolution, Lenin established the communist theories into practice. And that resulted into establishment of Soviet Union. And Soviet Union, within another one decade, one to two decades, it became a global power. And this inspired the communist ideologies, followed by the establishment of USSR, inspired the anti-imperial and decolonial movements across the world, including Asia and Africa and India was also inspired by the left wing ideologies in the post in, followed by the first world war after the second world war the china also became a communist state and india was the first nation to recognize china even before soviet union india had a very good relation with the chinese communist party led china but there was a turning point that was in the year 19, 1962 chinese troops invaded india and that resulted into indo chinese war and in this Indo-Chinese war, China emerged victory. And that invasion questioned all kind of government policies, including its security policy and foreign policy. And this 1962 war also resulted into a split in the Communist Party in India, which resulted into the CPI and the CPIM. CPI became pro-Soviet and the CPIM became pro-China. And followed by in the mid-60s, a CPI-CPM-led United Front government came to power in West Bengal. But the presence of West Bengal was going through suffering. They were affected due to the, the land system or the or the feudal system that was persisting in Bengal for a very long time. Therefore, this existing social injustice resulted in the formation of another branch of communist party that is communist party Marxist-Leninist, which was influenced by the idea of Maoism, a Maoism-based agrarian revolution. And the, the key leaders of this movement were Kannu Sanyal and uh, Jagan Santal. But the prominent leader was Charu Majumdar. What was the objective of this communist party Marxist-Leninist? The objective was the redistribution of land to working peasants to establish social justice. But the problem of this Marxist-Leninist faction is the, the means to achieve the goal. 
they are calling for a revolution that means overthrowing the state through armed revolution so this create law and order and security issues in india therefore the nationalist ideology became a problem and the government had to look into that so coming to the spread of this national so coming to the spread of this nationalism initially it was limited to west bengal and the eastern part of india but later in 1970s india was going through emergency therefore all kind of organizations were banned including the marxist leninists and therefore in that 70s there was a limitation in in spreading the nationalist ideologies but later after the in the post emergency period it started expanding to less developed areas including chatisgarh odisha and andhra pradesh and like i said this movement or this ideology was influenced by the maoist ideology advocating for armed rebellion that means overthrowing the state and establishing a new state of justice well their goal might be right in their perspective but the means to achieve the goal is beyond justification that is the problem and that is intolerable in a state like india and now we are going to see the causes behind the nexus the first major cause is tribal discontent due to forest conservation laws this includes the displacement of tribals from their indigenous land for example the forest conservation act 1980 prevented the tribal people from collecting forest uh, products and also other resources from the forest so this significantly impacted their livelihood and second major problem is displacement of tribal community for other development purposes like mega projects and mining and this displacement of these tribals and not looking into their welfare will become an opportunity for extreme organizations including nexalites for recruiting the marginalized uh, individuals and another major reason behind the cause of nationalism is socio economic inequalities that means one side it is flourishing other side less developed or underdeveloped so this will create a social and economic inequality and this will become an opportunity for the uh, extreme organizations to recruit people and therefore the people and at the same time it will be easy for them to convenient it it will be easy for them to convince the people to to join the extreme organizations and the next major reason will be the lack of government services in nexal affected areas and this will lead the and this will lead to social and economic inequalities and a lack of infrastructure development in the region for example the eastern part of india uh, for example the states of uh, chatisgarh bihar and west bengal they are facing problem of uh, lack of infrastructure in remote areas and the next major reason behind the cause of nexalism is confusion in government strategy regarding the nexalism that means the nexalists are standing for the that means the government itself has a confusion whether to treat nexalism as a social issue or as a security threat and the next major reason is lack of coordination between the central state government that is the state government often consider the nexalism or other problems as the responsibility of central government and this delays actions to contain problems like nationalism and other insurgent movements now we are going to see the government measures to prevent or to deal with the problem of nationalism the first major measure is operation green hand it was launched in the year 2010 to combat nationalism and followed by this operation there is a reduction in nexal affected districts from 223 in in 2010 to 90 in 2019 and the next major effort is rehabilitation programs for surrendered nexals that includes that includes better employment opportunities or that includes pardoning and these kind of things so these are the rehabilitative measures under the program and next we have aspirational district program this was launched in the year 2018 to improve the social and economic conditions in underdeveloped areas including nexal affected areas and then we have increased security force and intelligence efforts and this resulted into arrest of several nexal leaders and assassination of several nexal leaders and this significantly weakened the movement over one decade and this enhanced security force role has decreased the violent attacks in nexal regions in the past one decade so with this we are coming to the conclusion for the for the topic nexalism so in this topic we discussed the background of nexalism and the the causes for nexalism and what are the measures taken by the government to deal with the problem of nexalism so in this background try to answer this prelims question the question is which of the following is not a cause of nexalism option a tribal displacement due to development projects option b socio economic inequality option c poor infrastructure in remote areas and option d religious fundamentalism yes the correct answer is option d religious fundamentalism is not a cause for nexalism nexalism is an ideology which is influenced by the left wing principles so therefore religion has nothing to do with so the answer is option d So with this, we are moving to the next article. Look at this newspaper article. Have serious doubts about the legality and validity of Lieutenant Governor's power, says Supreme Court. This article is talking about a question raised by the Supreme Court on Friday regarding the legality and validity of powers exercised by the Delhi Lieutenant Governor under Section 487 of the Delhi Municipal Corporation Act 1957, and which directs 
the holding of election to fill up the sixth vacancy in the municipal corporation of delhi standing committee let us discuss more about the polity of delhi in this background from prelims point of view so we have to understand about that we all know that delhi is a union territory india is a state comprises of states as well as union territories so therefore the article 1 of indian constitution divides the territories into three categories first one is the territories of state second one is union territories and third one is the territories that india may acquire in future so this is how the territories are classified in the constitution article 1 now we are going to see more about the union territories so what is union territories union territories can be simply defined as centrally administered territories the article 239 of the indian constitution talks about the union territories and its administration at present we have eight union territories however their administration is not same for example puducherry jammu and kashmir and uh, delhi has legislative assembly while dadar and nagar haveli or lakshadweep does not have legislative assembly so this is uh, even though the union territories are same they are administered differently so here we are going to discuss more about delhi so delhi that is like i said the article 239 talks about the union territories administered by the central government through appointed administrator that can be governor or that can be lieutenant governor or sometimes even commissioner coming to the case of delhi the delhi become union territory through 69th constitution amendment in the year 1990 and it introduced a legislative assembly in delhi through amending article 239 of the indian constitution so what is the significance of article 239 AA? so like i said it established an assembly legislative assembly for delhi to legislate on certain on matters regarding state list and concurrent list but there is an exception in the state list the delhi assembly cannot make laws regarding public order police and land and what is the role of lieutenant governor in delhi he is the administrator of delhi appointed by the president and he oversees the functioning of delhi legislative assembly now we are going to see more about the powers of the lieutenant governor of delhi first one is the he act on the advice of council of ministers in the legislative assembly but he can also act based on his discretion in certain times Yes, second major function is discretion, that is the lieutenant government can act in discretion in certain cases. And the third function is referrals, that is the lieutenant governor can refer certain matters to president of India if there is any dis disagreement between the office of lieutenant governor and council of ministers. And the next important function is urgent matters, that is the lieutenant governor can take uh, immediate actions in certain situations based on his discretion, even while he is awaiting for president's decision. And the last important function of lieutenant governor is upholding the value of article 339 AA that is if he reports to the president of india that the the administration of delhi cannot be carried based on the provisions of article 339 AA then the president will suspend the article and will impose and will impose the central rule if it is required so we often in news see the conflict between the union government and the delhi government right so what is the reason behind this conflict the reasons behind this conflict are articles 339 and 339 AA. so for example recently there was an amendment that is government of national capital territory delhi 2000 2021 which attempted to restrict the delhi assembly's power and recently in 2023 there was a bill called delhi services act or government of national capital territory delhi amendment act 2023 which called for central government's control over the civil servants in the union territory of delhi so this kind of actions becomes a matter or a or a ground of conflict between the central government and the government of delhi so in the case of in the about two amendment act in 21 and 23 the delhi government challenged that citing it undermines the federalism and the principle of separation of powers by making the lieutenant governor the default authority so what was the judicial action in that so in the supreme court ruling 2018 the Supreme Court stated that left governor is bound by the advice of Council of Ministers for matters within the Assembly's lawmaking power. That means if the Assembly is making matters within the lawmaking power of the Union Territory of Delhi, then the left government has to follow the advice of the Council of Ministers. And what was the ruling in the, in the case of 2023? So here the Supreme Court upheld the Delhi government's control over civil servants and the day-to-day -day administration. So that is through the 2023 Amendment Act or the Delhi Services Act, the uh, the Union Government tried to bring try to bring a national capital civil services authority comprising of Chief Minister of Delhi and a Governor and a Chief Secretary. However, here also the left Governor will have a, will have discretion regarding the appointment or the transfer or the posting related regarding the civil servants in Delhi. So 
here also the 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 government of delhi challenged the citing it undermines the federal principles and the values of separation of power so here also the supreme court ruled that the, the delhi government has control over civil servants and day to day administration so what is the present issue so like i said the present issue is whether the left hand governor can nominate the 10 persons to the municipal corporation of delhi independently that is whether he is he has to follow the advice of council of ministers or he can act independently so that is the question well this is remaining as a question but considering the supreme court verdict of 2023 we can say that the Delhi government's executive power must be aligned with the parliamentary law based on the Delhi Municipal Corporation Act 1957. And therefore, the left-hand governor can nominate 10 experts to Municipal Corporation of Delhi. But the question is whether he, he has to follow the advice of Council of Ministers or he can act independently. So that we have to wait and see what will be the stand of Supreme Court. So with this, we are coming to the conclusion for this topic. And based on this, we will discuss a prelims practice question. The question is, which of the following statements is or are correct regarding the left-hand governor of national capital territory of statement 1, he or she can refer disagreements with ministers to president whose decision is final. Statement 2, the president can suspend article 239 AA provisions if national capital territory administration cannot be carried out as per article 339 AA based on the report from the left-hand governor. And statement 3, he or she can take immediate action if a matter is urgent even while awaiting the president's decision. The correct answer is option D, 1, 2 and 3. So, all the statements are correct. That means the left-hand governor can refer the disagreements with the ministers to president, then the president's decision will be final. And he can also give a report uh, to the president if the administration in the national capital cannot be carried out based on the provisions of article 239. And the third statement, it is also correct. That means if the matter is urgent, then the left-hand governor can take immediate action even while he, he is awaiting for the president's decision. So, all the three statements are correct regarding this. So, with this, we are moving to the next article. Look at this newspaper article, Maldivian president to visit India next week. The president of Maldives, that is Mohammed Moisu, will pay a five-day visit to India from October 6 to 10 and this will be his first state visit. We know that recently there was a strain in, in India-Maldives relation due to a lot of misunderstanding and policy shift. Therefore, this visit will be an opportunity to talk and resolve such confusions and uh, misunderstandings. And we also know that Maldives is India's key maritime neighbor and also has a special place in India in Prime Minister's vision of Tagar, that is security and uh, growth for all in the region. It is a part of India's neighborhood plus policy. So, let us discuss more about Sagar in this background from Prelim's point of view. First, we will start with the policy overview. So, Sagar, the expansion is security and uh, growth for all in the region. So, the focus of this policy is enhancing maritime cooperation in Indian Ocean region because Indian Ocean region is strategically and commercially very, very important. And here, India is the responsible stakeholder to ensure regional safety and security. And what are the key objectives of this saga? The first major objective is safeguarding Indian interest. That is through ensuring security in Indian Ocean region through protecting shipping lanes and economic activities. For example, India conducts Milan, a naval exercise including the, the nations of Indian Ocean region, enhance better maritime capability and uh, safeguard India's maritime interest. Second one is combating maritime threats that includes addressing issues such as piracy, smuggling, illegal fishing and human trafficking. And for example, since 2008, India leads the anti-piracy patrol in Gulf of Eden to counter the piracy that threats the international shipping lanes. And the next major objective is cooperation with the island nations because in in the Indian Ocean region, we have a lot of island nations such as Mauritius, Maldives, Seychelles, etc. And these nations are very important strategically and commercially. Therefore, enhancing cooperation with the island nations is another objective of Saga. That includes strengthening, like I said, the relation with the Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles. For example, to enhance the relation with the island nations, India gifted advanced light helicopters to Maldives for surveillance and disaster management because these island nations are very vulnerable. Not only these island nations, the island nations are very vulnerable to climate change and other natural disasters. And the next objective is capacity building. That means training the neighbor countries to face problems like security issues and disaster. And under this, India has provided extensive training to Coast Guard and naval personnel from Sri Lanka, Maldives and the Seychelles through Indian naval training team. Coming to the competence of Saga, the first major component is economic growth. That is through the policy, India will support Indian Ocean region nations to achieve economic growth, growth through trade, infrastructure development and sustainable fisheries. For example, India has committed an investment of $500 million for greater Maldi mail connectivity project. It connects the mail, the capital of Maldives with the other islands. And another component of the Sagar is security. That is focusing on cooperation 
in the field of defense and maritime domains to counter policies such as piracy, smuggling and human trafficking. For example, for example, joint naval exercise like Dosti is focusing on issues such as piracy, environmental degradation and maritime safety. And the next component of the policy is disaster management that includes collaboration on disaster relief including tsunami, cyclone and oil spill. For example, in 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, India provided emergency supplies and relief to Maldives. And the last component of the saga is environmental protection that includes measures to combat marine pollution, climate change, etc. For example, as a part of this, India supports Maldives in solar energy projects to reduce the carbon emission in the island nation. At the same time, India also extends support through international solar, solar alliance to ensure sustainable development. Now we are going to see the countries involved in the saga. The focus of the scheme is on Maldives, Sri Lanka, Seychelles, Mauritius and Madagascar. But at the same time, as a part of Sagar, India also enhanced its cooperation with the major powers such as Japan, Australia, US for regional security and safety. And what is the role of India? We have discussed this already. India provides naval assistance for capacity building programs and also supports sustainable development for marine infrastructure. And at the same time, India also plays an important role in security through providing patrolling, maritime surveillance and training to the neighbor nations. With this, we are coming to the conclusion on this topic. So in this topic, we discussed uh, the basics about Sagar, the objectives of Sagar, the components of Sagar, what are the countries involved in it, what is the role of India in Sagar. So in this background, try to answer this prelims practice question. The question is, with reference to India's Sagar, that is security and growth for all in the region initiative, consider the following statements. Statement 1, it emphasizes India's role in ensuring maritime security in, in the Indian Ocean region. Statement 2, the initiative focuses exclusively on economic growth and does not involve any defense or environmental cooperation. And statement 3, Sagar promotes cooperation with the island nations like Maldives, Seychelles, and uh, Mauritius. Which of the following statements given above is or are correct? Option A, 1 and 3 only. Option B, 1 only. Option C, 2 and 3 only and option D, 1, 2 and 3. The correct answer is option A, 1 and 3 only. Let's see. The correct, yes, the correct answer is option A, 1 and 3 only. Op therefore, option 2 is incorrect. The initiative focuses exclusively on economic growth and it does not involve any defense or environmental cooperation. Here, the statement goes wrong. So, the half statement is correct, but the half statement is wrong. The saga is also focusing on sustainable development and defense cooperation. Therefore, statement 2 is incorrect. Statement 1 and Statement 3 are correct. So, with this, we will move to the next article. Look at this newspaper article, how elephants are counted. This article is taken from the newspaper Indian Express. This article is talking about the, the elephant census report published by the Ministry of Environment. The report is called the status of elephant in India 2022-2023. This report shows a sharp decline in elephant population, the keystone population in large part of India. For example, in West Bengal, the decline was around 84%, in Jharkhand it is 64%, in Odisha it is 54% and in Kerala it is 51%. So, elephant, we have discussed so many times regarding the role of elephants and the initiatives taken by the government to protect the elephants. So, in this background, today we are going to discuss the initiatives taken by the government to protect the other keystone species including elephants and what is the role of keystone species in the ecosystem. So, let us begin the discussion from the prelims point of view. So, first we are going to see what is keystone species. Keystone species is a species that disproportionately plays a large role in its ecosystem management. That means it plays an important role in maintaining the structure and balance of the ecosystem. If that keystone species got removed, then it will lead to the collapse of that ecosystem and loss of biodiversity. Okay, now we are going to see some examples of keystone species and their role in the ecosystem and initiatives taken by the government to protect them. The first major keystone species is elephant. So, what is the role of this elephant? They are also known as ecosystem engineers because they maintain the balance of the forest and uh, savanna ecosystem. Through dispersing seeds, they they play an important role in expansion of grassland and flora and they create water hole by digging ground and also shapes the landscape through knocking down the trees. And what are the government initiatives? The first major initiative is Project Elephant launched in the year 1992. It aims to protect, conserve and manage the wild elephants and their habit. And second, we have Gajayatra campaign. It raises awareness regarding the rising cases of man-elephant conflict. And then we have elephant corridors. These are established to safeguard the movement of elephants and protect their habit. And then we have synchronous all India elephant estimation to monitor the elephant population. And the next keystone species is tiger. They are known as apex predators because they regulate the prey population like deers. And what are the government initiatives? First major initiative is project tiger launched in the year 1973. This project tiger focuses on reduction of man tiger conflict, population monitoring, 
and uh, habitat conservation. And then we have National Tiger Conservation Authority. It's a statutory body established under the Ministry of Environment. They implement the programs regarding the tiger conservation. And then we have a CAMBA fund for afforestation. Through afforestation, we will restore the, the habitat for wild animals. That includes tigers. And then we have M-Stripes technology. That is monitoring system for tiger intensive protection and ecological status. This technology uses the stripes on tiger to protect every tiger in the forest. And the next keystone species is honeybee. What is the role of honeybee? It, they play an important role in pollination, which is a very essential for plants reproduction and also supports biodiversity and food security. For example, a decline in the population of honeybee can also impact the production of apples. So honeybee is that much important. What are the initiatives taken by the government to promote the protection of the honeybee? First, we have National Beekeeping and Honey Mission. It is under the Ministry of Agriculture, which promotes scientific beekeeping practices and increasing honey production. And then we have developed the pollinators garden and the reserves to protect the habitat of honey. And then we have integrated pest management. It uh, promotes the usage of biofertilizers to reduce the impact due to chemical fertilizers on honey. And the next keystone species is coral reefs. They play an important role in supporting the marine diversity because they provide shelter and food for many small and micro organisms in the, in the marine ecosystem and also protect the coastal lines from erosion and also contributes to fisheries. And what are the initiatives taken? First initiative is coral reef conservation program under the Ministry of Environment. And then we have a coral transplantation and restoration. And this initiative is focused on regions like Lakshadweep, Andaman and Nicoba. And apart from this, we also have a mangroves for the future and the integrated coastal zone management for the protection of ecosystem. So under this topic keystone species, we have discussed different keystone species, their role in the ecosystem and what are the initiatives taken by the government to protect the keystone species. So with this idea, try to answer this prelims practice question. The question is which of the following is the keystone species in India? Option A, olive ridley turtle, option B, tiger, option C, nilgai and option D, great Indian bustard. The correct answer is option B. Let's see the correct answer. Yes, the correct answer is option B. Tiger is the keystone species given in the option. So with this, we are coming to the conclusion for today's newspaper analysis. If you like the video, hit the like button and also give your feedbacks as comments and share this content with your friends and also subscribe to, to the channel before leaving and also hit the bell icon to receive on-time update. We'll meet again. Thank you. Have a nice day.